to uh, our final stretch. Start today looking at uh, a couple uh, types of penguins with uh, fancy headgear. Uh, we have here a rock hopper penguin. I think these were on one of the, the Falkland Islands um, uh, south of South America. And you know, close up, you can see they have a kind of a pretentious eyebrow going on and this kind of reddish, reddish eye. And they uh, sometimes nest near uh, uh, black uh, albatross. Um, black albatross, uh, interesting that uh, they can live up to 70 years, one of these birds, which means they probably live at least twice as long as the penguins who are, are sharing the island. Albatross are birds that can uh, kind of lock their wings in place and stay in the air over the ocean for days or weeks at a time, even longer. Uh, the rockhopper penguins do make nests out of uh, mud, other materials. You can see they, they have the, the dirty feet to show for it. Um, and, uh, but even, even more elaborate than the rockhopper penguin uh, is the macaroni penguin with this uh, almost crown of, of yellow feathers on the top of his head. Uh, looks, looks very important. All right, what questions do you have about uh, allocators, memory caching, memory hierarchy? Let me see. Are they talking to us? Do we need to know what tier? Uh, eat. If you are working as partners, each person needs to make a check-in post. The, the points of the check-in post will be separate for the two partners. Every, all other parts of the grade are based on the shared submission. I should also say only one partner needs to submit on Moodle, and then we'll just put in the, uh, the grade for both, both folks. Uh, other questions? There's one more, one more point about how, how long the, uh, the Malik lab might take. Uh, that can also depend on uh, how you go about debugging. So uh, if you go about de debugging by adding arbitrary print statements, uh, it might, or just staring at the code, it might take a very long time. Uh, if you take a more systematic approach, that is find a particular test case where it fails, make uh, heavy use of print heap and check heap and potentially GDB, I would expect debugging to proceed far more efficiently. So uh, there's a lot more advice about debugging in, in the write-up when you get to that point. All right, so our task today is to examine the way in which uh, the memory we've been working with has been a complete illusion this whole time. So it's all been a fiction. Uh, like we've seen things like move cube, from the place in memory that uh, RDI points to, move that into the register RIX, and We've had this conception that our memory is just this very large array of bytes uh, and that every program has the same memory addresses to work with. However, if, say, we have a a 64-bit memory address, uh, we definitely do not have this many bytes on our system. This is, uh, like that number would be several exabytes, or uh, 1.8 times 10 to the 19th bytes. So no, no computer system has this many bytes on it, uh, nor
Would a computer system possibly have this many bytes for each program? But we've been thinking about this whole time. Each program has this full address space to work with. So we don't have enough physical memory on the machine to meet what we presented as our picture of memory thus far. Uh, and we also don't want programs to be able to interfere with each other's memory. We don't want program A to be able to change values uh, that program B is, is using in memory. Up until now, we've just programs access memory addresses that we haven't thought about this possibility. What if they are, are using the same address? What, what would happen? So we have some problems we need to solve when it comes to memory. The first is how does everything, everything fit? Uh, and just to give another sense of scale, If this is the size of our address space, our 2 to the 64 different bytes we can address, which are a little VM for virtual memory, that's our physical memory in relation to our virtual memory. So how are we going to make everything fit? We also have the question, where do things go? that if program one and program two, uh, they each have a stack, they each have a heap, they each have a section of memory where code goes, etc. And so where do we put programs one stack, where do we put programs two stack, where do we put their heaps? Because what we've talked about so far, is, so far is that these two will use the same range of addresses for their stack. But they can't actually be in the same place, uh, otherwise they, they'd overwrite each other. For this, uh, we have this isolation piece, how do we protect programs from one another? But we also, need to know how do we actually share memory when we want to. That if we have, say, the code for printf somewhere in memory, we might want program one and program two to both be able to use the same code for printf rather than just having the exact same code multiple times in memory. So we want them to be isolated from each other, but we want them to be able to share in certain circumstances. So our solution is going to be to add a layer of indirection that is Program one and program two will each have their own set of virtual memory and then there'll be this layer, this mapping, which will handle translating our virtual memory into physical memory. So each of our programs, what they are interacting with is this illusion that's called virtual memory. And there's part of our system which is sitting between our programs and the actual physical memory, which is handling, okay, program one accesses data in virtual memory. That's here in physical memory, and there's something that's helping us do that translation to actually get uh, uh, the data in physical memory. So this is going to give us our uh, 
isolation because this mapping can prevent these two programs from interfering with each other. This mapping is going to give us our ability to share because it can, at the same time as preventing them from accessing each other's memory when they shouldn't, it can also have two points in this virtual memory be the same place in physical memory. But that still leaves, uh, and, and this is going to take care of where do things go, because again, this mapping is saying, okay, this spot in virtual memory is actually here in physical memory. And so there, this, while the stack might be in the same place in the virtual memory of each program, this mapping can put them in different places in physical memory, and the programs don't need to know anything about this. But how does stuff fit is not necessarily answered by this. So one part of that is all right, there may be large sections of this virtual memory that this program isn't using. And so we don't actually need to have a spot for that in physical memory. Like the physical memory that a program actually uses is the part of its virtual memory that it actually needs. So for using some small fraction of our whole virtual address space, we can handle that. But what if our programs do use collectively more physical memory than we have? Can we facilitate that in some way? And for this, we can use the same ideas that we were talking about with caching last time, where We can have our physical memory act as a cache for data that's on our local storage, our disk, with the idea that our program one has some virtual memory as does program two. And here's our physical. And each of these kind of segments that I've drawn here is called a page of memory. It's just a chunk. And when I talked about caching, I said caches store blocks of memory. The same idea that our, the, our memory is going to be subdivided up into these pages, these large chunks of memory, larger than the blocks in a cache would be. Something like uh, uh, four megabytes would be uh, a typical sort of page size. And with these chunks, the other part of this picture is our disk, our hard drive, often drawn as a, a cylinder. And some pages in virtual memory might map to physical pages. And then others to pages that are that are only on disk. The consequence of this is, since memory is acting as a cache for the disk, the pages that we're currently working with that we need to access quickly, those will reside in physical memory. And those that we don't need in the moment or that we're done with or we won't need for a while can sit on the disk. And so this means that the total memory of all of our programs 
uh, use kind of throughout their lifetime can exceed the amount of physical memory that we have available. Because anything that doesn't fit can be on disk. Questions on this so far? Oh. Uh, that's, that's a fair question. What if the amount of memory you're using exceeds the amount of disk space? Uh, fortunately, disk space is much, much cheaper per byte than memory. So, uh, that's not a situation that would be that common. Um, but if we don't have enough disk space, then we're kind of screwed. Then we need to kill one of or more of these programs because if we let them keep going, our system is going to grind to a halt. Uh, since, like with caching, whenever we go to uh, access a page that isn't in memory, we bring it in memory. And if memory is full, we need to kick a page out back to disk. And if the amount of memory we're actively working with is bigger than our physical memory, we're going to have to be doing this swapping of pages all the time. And it's going to be very slow, since as we talked about, our accessing disk is orders of magnitude slower than accessing memory. So if we have to go to disk a lot, our system's going to grind to a halt. Other questions? <clears throat> Chris? Um, I think you mentioned this last week, but the bigger the physical memory, doesn't that heat up the CPU more so we can't just make a physical memory just check on this? Uh, the question is, uh, does making physical memory generate more heat? And so there are, are limits on that. Um, it's not the size of physical memory, it's the number of uh, the density of transistors on our CPU was what hit this limit of, of heat. Where if we wanted to make the CPU fast, be able to do more instructions per second, we sort of hit a limit with that with respect to heat. Uh, there is not a heat issue when it comes to memory. It's actually, uh, I think one of the biggest impediments is a size issue. Like if we could have 16 gigabytes of memory in an extremely small uh, 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 component, then we could locate that at, at much closer to the, to the CPU. But gigabytes of memory, with the current storage technology we have, at least cost-effective ones, it's just too big to actually make it part of the CPU and be as fast as those tiny caches that were part of the CPU. So it's, when it comes to, to memory, it's kind of a space issue, being able to, to locate things together. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Other questions? Yeah? Um, could you elaborate on what is like a virtual memory? Because like, does a program kind of assumes it has a certain amount of virtual memory that is not actually used or stored? It, like, but the part that is actually, but the part it actually uses is storing. Yes, that, that's a great question. Do our programs assume they have a particular amount of virtual memory uh, and how does that relate to what's actually stored in physical memory? Uh, and this is one of the great things about virtual memory. We can just allow every program to assume it has uh, 2 to the 64th bytes to work with. Every single program has this giant virtual address space. And it, uses uh, uh, addresses in there. And then it's this mapping, which I'm about to explain in more detail, that handles, OK, a, a virtual address in this program, what byte does that correspond to in physical memory? And if there are addresses that of which there will be many that program one is not using in its virtual address space. We don't need to have corresponding bytes for those in physical memory because they're not being used. They don't need to, to store anything. All right, so 
there's kind of two pictures of how accessing memory works. There's physical addressing, and this is where our CPU just directly uses physical, physical addresses. It wants the, the CPU says, okay, give me the integer at physical address four. Just goes to that index in physical memory, reads the four bytes there, which are sent back to the CPU. And early computer systems exclusively use physical addressing uh, modern microcontrollers, a uh, small uh, basically uh, s small computers that control drones or uh, uh, embedded systems that would control traffic lights or weather sensors, things like that, might use physical addressing, uh, and Cray supercomputers, uh, just because if we can avoid this layer in, uh, in direction, that's kind of less work the system has to do for memory accessing. When we get to virtual addressing, we again have our CPU, uh, and on the chip with the CPU is something called the Memory Management Unit, or MMU, and the CPU We'll be using a virtual address. So our CPU says, OK, give me the integer at address hex 4100. And then the MMU is translating that into a physical address. So kind of what comes out of the MMU is our physical address of 4. And so then that reads the four bytes at that address in physical memory, sends those back to the CPU. But there's this component, this memory management unit, that is doing this translation from our virtual address to the physical address. So there are a few reasons why we want to, uh, why we want to, uh, the, there are a, a few reasons why this is a very useful way to design a system. Uh, first, we can use memory more efficiently because we can treat it as a cache for the disk. That we only need in physical memory what we're currently using, and everything else can sit on the disk. And this translation step is what's going to let us check. Is the thing we're looking for currently in memory, or do we need to go get it off the disk? This model also greatly simplifies things from the program's perspective. Because now our programs have the same range of addresses every time they run on any uh, Linux computer, no matter what else is running in memory. The stack, the code, the heap, they're all at the same place. So we don't have to write programs that need to care about, oh, where in physical memory is this thing actually going to be? It's just a predictable, simple view that every program gets because this translation step is handled outside of the program. And finally, it's this translation step that's going to protect, protect our programs from one another. That at this point, we can prevent potentially bad or malicious memory accesses. If this address is somewhere this program is not allowed to access, the system can intervene at this point. 
we care about studying this because this kind of layer of indirection uh, is central to the design of system components across many levels, uh, both um, in caching, how our programs use memory, uh, et cetera. And there are ways that uh, understanding this is going to uh, help us write better code uh, and, and more efficient code. All right, questions on this picture here? All right, so let's dive in and look at this address translation step in a little more detail. So we have our virtual address. And it has n bits in our virtual address. And we're going to divide this into a page offset that's going to be p bits and a and a virtual page number or VPN that is n minus p bits. So this is something that our, our MMU is doing. It gets in the virtual address and it's going to extract from that a virtual page number and a page offset. So then in memory somewhere, we have something called a page table, which is the, the data structure our system is using to keep track of where our physical pages are, are they in memory or not, and so on. And this table will have some number of entries, and the fields in this table, that we'll, at least that we'll look at right now, are a valid bit and a physical page number or PPN. And our MMU is going to use this virtual page number as an index into our page table. So this virtual page number piece, we use as an index into the page table to look up the entry there. And our valid bit If it's a one, it means that our page, the, the corresponding physical page to this virtual page is in memory. And if it's zero, it means that the page is not in memory. This is when it is in memory. That's going to be a page hit, just like when we found the data we were looking for in a cache, that was a cache hit. When it's not in memory, that is called a pit that triggers a page fault. It's a page miss and it triggers a page fault, which invokes operating system code to go get the page from disk and put it in memory. We'll talk about Fault is a particular, is a more general term than, than just virtual memory. Uh, and when we talk about uh, exceptional control flow, um, next time, get more into 
what actually happens when you have a fault. But we go look up the, the page table entry. Is it in memory? If it is, so in that case, okay. if it is in memory, then we will construct our physical address will consist of our page offset and the physical page number we got from the page table. So this translation process is get our virtual page number, it's an index into our page table. That's going to tell us if our page is present in memory or not. If it is, the other part of that entry is an index in physical memory, kind of which chunk, which page of physical memory does this virtual address map to. And this page offset, we can think of as an in index within the page. These are the lower order bits of our address. Because if our page is 4 megabytes, this offset is telling us where in that 4 megabytes is the actual address we're looking for, and that just forms the lower bits of our, our physical address. Because this page offset is the same, is the same in the virtual address and the physical address, this means that our pages or chunks of uh, memory in, uh, in virtual memory need to be the same size as the physical pages, as the chunks that we're using the same number as an index into the page. So if we have four megabyte pages, there are four megabyte chunks in virtual memory corresponding to four megabyte chunks in physical memory. So this is what happens when we get a page hit, when it is in memory. When we have a page fault, we have to do the following, the system does the following steps. Uh, if our physical memory is full, we will need to Identify the page that we're going to replace. Just like we need, we in uh, caching often least recently used. We want to kick out the block in our cache that was the least recently used to make room for a new one. When it comes to pages, we'll often have some more sophisticated page replacement uh, algorithm than just least recently used. That's kind of beyond the scope of what we're what we're looking at here. Um, If the page we're replacing has been modified, we need to get those changes to show up on disk. Because our, our physical memory is a cache for what's on disk, and so any change that's no longer going to be, that we made, that's no longer going to be in physical memory, we have to write that to the disk to make sure that it stays around if we need to bring that page back into memory in the future. Uh, then, We copy the new page from disk into memory. Update our page table. So 
Now that page is valid, we can fill in the physical page number where we just copied the page in to memory. And finally, we're going to restart whichever instruction caused the page fault. So we have a program that attempts to access memory at a virtual address. We look up in the table, we find that valid bit is zero. That page is not in physical memory. So then, potentially replacing some page that's currently in memory, we're going to copy the page that we're looking for into memory. Update our table to say, OK, that page is now in memory, and here's where it is. And then restart the assembly instruction that is trying to access that memory. So now when it goes again to try and access that same address, it will find, oh, that page is in memory, and here's where it is, because we just brought it in. All right, what are your questions on this? Eric? I don't quite understand uh, step two right out of the bottom five. So it might be the case that we brought some a page into memory. Uh, maybe it's the code for some function. And all we did was execute it. We didn't change it at all. So in that case, when we replace that page, we can just overwrite it because it already exists on disk and we don't need to, there's nothing that changed while it was in memory that we would need to copy those changes to disk. But if it's some data, some large array that we updated, if we're going to kick it out of memory so that it only exists on disk, we haven't yet copied the changes that we made to this data while it was in memory to disk. And we need to make sure those changes are copied because in the future, if we want, if we bring that page back into memory, we want those changes to still be there. So this is just, uh, we have a four megabytes in memory, and if it's been modified, we need to copy those four megabytes to the disk uh, before, before we replace them with our new page. Does that make sense? Paul. Uh, when does like looking for the data in the disk happen? Um, so uh, I told you that these entries here are the physical page number. Um, so what are they in the case where uh, we uh, it is not, in the case where we don't have a physical page number, our page table is going to store the location on disk where we can find that page. So the page table will tell us, okay, go read this location on disk to find the page you're looking for. So it would be in, I mean, there's not, a, there's not really a searching through disk. We're just like going to a spot on disk and, and reading bytes there. Does that make sense? Um, where in the system does it tell us what the size of a page is? Also, was that other tab in a monster manual entry? Uh, there, there, there may have been uh, Dungeons and Dragons briefly on screen. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, where does it tell us the size of a page? This is something that the operating system defines. Okay. The operating system will just say, okay, pages are four megabytes. And this is just true. Are they always that size? No, I mean, again, and you, this can be configured within the operating system. But like every page can have the same size. Yes. The yes. Page. Okay. yes. All page because our uh, the yeah the operating system is managing the memory for all our programs, and it will just have a page size that it's working with. Okay. Chris, um, so this address translation is that what the that's just essentially the memory management unit. Yes, exactly. Yeah, the memory management unit is uh, the part of the system that is performing this kind of lookup at the page table and, uh, and doing this, this translating from our virtual to, to physical address. Okay, okay so virtual address is like 64 bits. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, if our page offset isn't like pretty big, then like our virtual page is going to be a ton of bits itself. And so isn't there going to have to be like 
so many indexes in this page table? Uh, yes, that is that is a, an excellent observation. That say our our, our pages have uh, ten bit offsets. That leaves uh, fifty four bits left over for our virtual page number. So do we need need two to the fifty fourth entries in our page table? That's sitting in memory. We're back to the problem. We just have way more stuff we need to put in memory than we have. So. Uh, the, the, the textbook gets into this. Uh, we won't have time to, to get into the details, though we will if you take operating systems next term. Uh, the short answer is we don't have one ta page table. We have multiple levels of page table. So we have one page table that just has a 1,000 entries. And each of those entries points to another page table with a 1,000 entries. And if you have a bunch of these levels, then if you have huge chunks of virtual memory that aren't used, you save yourself a ton of a ton of page table entries. So, the yeah, the, the takeaway is this is a simplified view of this data structure that has this problem that it would be way too huge if it was this simple in practice. And there are there are ways to deal with this. Other questions? Okay. This page table is always stored in physical memory, so like. If we get, like if my computer's running, then we just page two on this way out. That's like three times space. And it will always be there in my life. Yes, we do need the page table in memory. Um, though, um, uh, uh, for uh, we will also need a separate page table for each currently running program. Because each currently run, running program has its own set of virtual addresses that might be the same between programs. So if we have a program that's running but isn't being actively used, the, the page table for that program could be paged out and actually be on disk and not memory. But yes, for any program that's, that's currently accessing memory, its page table, or at least part of its page table, needs to be in memory so that we can use it for this address translation. Oh. Wait, so like the page table itself exists on the page, which another program could decide is least important and write it out and all the is needed again? Uh, so our, our page table does exist on a page in memory. Uh, it would be very important for our algorithm for deciding which page to replace to not choose the page table to replace. That's going to cause some problems. So yes, we'll need to be uh, uh, we'll need to, to be aware that there are certain pages in memory we just can't page out. Other questions? Silas? Oh, is that, so if, the, if you've got multiple pages for all the different programs, how does how do you still avoid the two different um, programs according to the same stuff? Now, how do we avoid two different programs overwriting each other in physical memory? So, when we have a page from program one, say we have a page from program one. I'll call that A. Uh, when we bring that in from when we bring that in from disk, we put it somewhere yeah. in physical memory. Uh, we have a page for program two. I'll call B. We bring that in from disk. We put it somewhere else in physical memory. Right, right, right. Now, our program one it goes to access some virtual address outside any of its pages. We look up; those pages aren't in memory. Maybe that address is just outside of the range that program one is allowed to access, period. And at that point, it's going to trigger a fault, and the operating system will say, segmentation fault, you're done, program over. So it's because memory accesses are through this kind of referee, this memory management unit, that any nonsense the operating system can just say, no, you don't get to do that. Is it's sitting between the programs and physical memory. And this is the key to this isolation, 
that we have this layer that programs can't mess with that is monitoring and overseeing every single memory access. Other questions? Question? Um, I'm pretty sure on Windows systems there's a page file on your disk which is dedicated to pages. Is that how Linux systems are um, structured as well? There's a page file on the disk where pages go? Yes, it's, it's very common to that there is just a file on disk which uh, has just consecutive chunks in it which are the different pages uh, and so there's just a place where the pages that we have on disk start and we're just writing to different kind of parts of the big chunk of disk space that is that file to manage the, the pages. And yeah, so, um, and this is just a, a file that, that is sitting on disk that you can you can potentially go look at. I didn't. <laughs> uh, the, the, uh, I mean, you would, maybe with administrator access, I mean, the operating system will, will require some sort of authentication, most likely. Uh, but I mean, you, if it's your system, you can, I'm sure you can kind of get up to, to pretty much whatever you want <laughs> eventually. Um, could you like edit the page and have like the page name page point to a page that's also the page that you have? Like, go to the page table and set two things the same as the address and then two programs, like message and whatever that? Uh, could a program go in and, and, and mess with the, the page table since this is managed by the operating system? Um, it's going to be an op uh, modifying the page table is going to be something that only the operating system is allowed to do, uh, and so uh, a program would need to. Uh, and the way that, that this is structured is that any time a program needs something to happen that only the operating systems can do, it turns over control to the operating system. As like, please go do this thing. The operating system does it as long as it's not going to mess anything up, and then the operating system gives control back to the program. So, uh, without somehow exploiting or subverting the operating system, a program could not go and start messing with the page table itself. Chris, so. Um, so these a bunch of programs have similar, the same virtual address, mm -hmm. right? Because the heap and the stack start the same place. Exactly. So then wouldn't they have the same, would they be accessing the same pages and the same offsets and they're each other? They have the same virtual address. They do have the same virtual address, but they don't have the same page table. These are programs that have different page table, which will cause the same virtual addresses to go to different physical pages. Okay. How do they assign uh, page? Uh, so, the available set of physical pages is going to are, is going to be managed by some part of the operating system, and it's responsible for sort of handing these out. Uh, and so, because it's managed centrally, there's it can prevent any sort of handing out the same physical page twice. All right, so I have here on the screen uh, a kind of small example of what we've been talking about, uh, where we have our page table sitting in, in memory, and we have PTE stands for page table entry, which in this case is a valid bit, and then either a physical page number or a disk address. And we can have pages that are, are valid and that uh, include some physical page number. So over here we have our four physical pages in, in memory, index 0, 1, 2, 3. And so our, our virtual page, um, this one is mapped to this physical page. And some virtual pages are just currently unused, and some were used or were loaded in, uh, but are, are currently sitting on the disk. And so our page table will have uh, a disk address. So let's say that uh, in this example, the page size is four kilobytes, which will correspond to a 12, 12 page offset bits, since K 
kilobytes, 2 to the 10th bits, megabytes, 2 to the 20th, gigabytes, 2 to the 30th. So if we have kilobytes, that's 2 to the 10th, so 4 of them, that's another 2 squared, so that's 12 total bits to give us an offset within 4 kilobytes. And so if my virtual address here, which uh, is uh, showing as um, perhaps uh, uh, 20, 24 bits, if I take the first 12 bits as, as the offset, that's three hex digits, so that's 40B, and my uh, physical page number then is the remaining bits, 007, or my virtual page number, sorry. And so virtual page number, I go into my page table using the virtual page number as an index. I find an entry here. It is a, a page hit because I found something with a valid bit of, of one. So I take my physical page number, and uh, which is uh, two, which is what I found in the page table, combine it with my offset to get my physical address, and then my address 240B somewhere in this physical page two. As our, the, the address starts with, with two, that's gonna take me to this page, and then 40B is the, the offset within this four kilobytes here. So that is, a, that is a page hit. Does that make sense? Any questions on that? Sounds? Not specifically about this, but in general. Mm -hmm. If you have an array that's, taking, that's bigger than an entire like, page, doesn't that just like, seriously mess with, with everything? Or no? Because then you're, it'll increment as you go to the last you know, elements of the array, it'll let change what page you're on, right? Uh, that's absolutely right. We have a, a, an array that's bigger than a page. So maybe, uh, so, so th this is the way in which virtual memory is this convenient lie. Yeah. The virtual memory is telling the program, oh, this array of uh, a million integers is all contiguous in memory. But in fact, various chunks of it could be anywhere in physical memory. But the beauty is we can just access the addresses and this translation entirely transparent yeah. to us sends us to the right physical it's not page. contiguous in memory. Uh, could be, but we have no we have no guarantee it's contiguous in physical memory. But this uh, this technology we're using for for physical memory, uh, dynamic random access memory. Random access means we can jump to any point in the memory, just like we can index to any point in an array kind of with equal efficiency. So just because our array is split up in different physical pages doesn't actually hurt us. Here. How did you get that physical address? Uh, I took the physical page number, which in this case is just two, and I combined it with my page offset. So I didn't have a, a row for this here. Uh, but if I had my page offset, if my page is four kilobytes, my page offset is the lowest 12 bits of my address. So in this, P would be 12. So the lowest 12 bits is the page offset, and each hex digit is four bits, so that's the first three hex digits here. And I combined my physical page number with the page offset to generate the physical address like this. Um, and I know that this physical address is somewhere within this physical page too, because this, this physical page number tells me kind of which 
chunk of physical memory, which physical page the address I'm looking for is in, and then the page offset is going to tell me the individual byte within that page that I'm that I'm accessing. Yeah, Can you explain how you know the offsets 12 bits? So the offset comes from the page size. So uh, if my, so let's say, in this case, page size, four kilobytes, which is four times two to the 10th bytes. As a kilobyte is two to the 10th bytes. Uh, 1,024 bytes. And so I'll rewrite four as a power of two. Two squared times two to the 10th bytes. And I have this, an expression like this, same base, can just add the exponents. This gives me two to the 12th bytes. That's how many bytes are in my page. And my offset needs to specify an individual byte within my page. And so the number of bits I need to specify one of two to the 12th different things is 12 bits. This, with 12 bits, I can represent two to the 12th different numbers. Does that make sense? Yeah, so when we're thinking about a virtual memory system, this sort of working from how big things are to how many bits we need to address them uh, is, is going to be an important step. Will the number of kilobytes always be like the power of two? What if it was six kilobytes? Yes, the systems will always have powers of two, uh, that makes everything work out much nicer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in physical memory, why does the, like, <coughs> um, so for the, the physical page number, for this example, we have the, we have the page number equals two. <coughs> Is it because the system, like, stores in the physical memory of, of page two? Like, I'm wondering why is the, in the physical memory, like the virtual page number, like it's not like ordered, like from ascending order. Uh, good question. Why, uh, like, how did we end up with virtual page one, then two, then seven, then then four? Uh, so, whenever our page is not in memory. We identify some place to put it, and then copy it in there. So there's no there's no step where the order that virtual pages show up in physical memory matches the order they show up in virtual memory. It's kind of wherever the the, the system puts them into physical memory. Um, so if we if we look at an example of a page fault, um, we uh, I would like. Uh, uh, you to discuss, take a minute to discuss with your, your neighbors, uh, what's a virtual address that would cause a page fault for this highlighted page table entry? That is, what's a, come up with a virtual address that would correspond to this page table entry and thus result in a page fault where I have to get a page off of disk. Yeah, All right. Uh, su suggestion for a, a virtual address that would uh, give us the the desired page fault. Hello. Uh, like hex three thousand. Like that. Yeah. Uh, why? Why did you what? Why would this give us that page fault? Um, the three, 
the, the full page number will then be three, which gets us to the invalid spot. And then the last three digits are just whatever to the top. So. Exactly. So uh, we could also write this as 003, and then any pay, any any uh, lowest 12 bits will do, because that's the page offset part. That doesn't affect where we go in the page table. So in this case, our virtual page number is 3. We go here, and we hit a page fault. It's valid bit is zero, this isn't in memory, and it says here is the place on disk where this page you're looking for is. So following our steps for a page fault, we need to identify some page to replace because our virtual memory is full. Or sorry, our physical memory is, is full. So let's say by whatever algorithm we're using, we identify virtual page four as the as the one to replace. So we're going to uh, make that, uh, we're gonna write out any changes to that page to disk. Uh, we're then going to copy our uh, new page, virtual page three, into that place in physical memory, update our page table, and update the entry for the one we replaced, say, okay, that's not valid, or the one we just paged in is valid and maps to this spot. And then uh, uh, we wouldn't change anything about page three on disk, uh, but using the convention I have, uh, have here, I might gray it out to show just like, this is one of the pages currently in memory. Uh, and at that point, we can then restart this memory access, at which point we go to this place in the page table, our page is in memory, what, what great luck. We then say, okay, this is actually physical page three, followed by our, uh, sorry, physical page three, and so our physical address is three with whatever our, our offset is, we go read our, our memory. Uh, there. Do you have the same value with 6 to nine. Another option. Uh, say more what you mean. Uh, like instead of like 3, also put 6. 6 would also help. Oh, I see. Yes. So, so yeah, I was, was asking kind of what address would cause a fault for this entry, but yes, any, any accessing any entry uh, that isn't valid would, would cause a page fault. Oh. Uh, so, it, <clears throat> that, that would depend on, uh, like what that what that actually is. Um, though in in Linux programs, uh, kind of low addresses below um, hex four hundred thousand are just like never. Those are reserved. Um, uh, the programs can't use those. So accessing pages in there would uh, cause a page fault and. The resolution of that page fault would be this is an invalid access and, and the program would end with a segmentation fault. Uh, so that's kind of what this is, is representing is our kind of lowest pages might just, uh, those addresses are, are, are not available. Other questions, Nina? Would it return the same thing if you access the hacks by installing more like the normal role? Um, so in this case, that address might be valid, and so we might actually allocate a new empty page on disk and bring that into memory. All right, let's do a little more practice with our cards. All right, so consider which of these would not cause a page fault. Please. 
please uh, take a minute to discuss with your neighbors why you think it's the one you chose. Uh, we've had uh, some movement towards C, which is what we'll get. Uh, intuition for this, a page fault happens when we try and access memory. C is the only thing there that doesn't involve accessing memory. So all of the others involve a memory access that uh, is going to result in a, in a page table entry that's not valid. And so we'll cause a page fault. Dividing by zero will cause a fault, as we'll talk about it next time, just not a page fault, because it's not this. We need to get a page off of disk. All right. We don't have time for another practice exercise, so look forward to that on Wednesday. And uh, have... Uh, office hours tomorrow night. The quiz is out due tomorrow night as well. I will see you on Wednesday.